Okay, chapter 7. We are going to transition a little here uh, in that your average man, when confronted by trial and disaster, usually gives it a little bit of thought, but not much. Uh, mostly, your average guy, when he's confronted by disaster, he's looking for a way out or something to, to fix what's wrong. Uh, if you got a sore throat, what do you do? Well, you go to the doctor, you get some medicine, you try and get over it as quick as possible. Hey, short stuff. Anyway, you try and get over it as quick as possible, and you don't give it too much thought other than immediate relief, right? That's who we are human nature-wise. We don't think of latter or stronger repercussions that, well, what if I don't treat it, what happens? Well, then it gets worse, and infection grows, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Same thing with any kind of disease. So, human nature, like dogs and everything else, if a dog gets hurt, what does he do? Well, you want to just set him down and take care of it, but what does the dog do? He wants to run away and hide, exactly. He wants to run away from the hurt. And when he's running away on a broken leg, he, what he's doing is just making the hurt hurt more. Uh, but they don't realize that. Well, we say, well, it's just a dog. Well, we don't realize that either too much. Other than if our leg was broken, we go, ow, that hurts, ow, that hurts, ow, that hurts. We'll acknowledge it every, every step of the way while we're running. And so it is even more so with emotional and psychological and spiritual pains. We don't understand them. We don't understand the hurt. And then, of course, we always come, in, come to question God. And this is who we are right here. We say, well, God, why did this happen to me? Or why did you let this happen to me? That's when we not only question it, but we blame him. And that's pretty much human nature. We never say, uh, God, give me the strength to master this. How many ever pray like that? Nobody. Not even ministers, I'm sorry. I was sad to say. We always say, well, Lord, why did my church fail? Lord, why do these people hate me? Lord, why? Do we never ask, God, what did I do to screw stuff up? And more, what can I do to straighten it out and to heal whatever is broken? Don't worry, why would you give me this church full of mean, nasty people? You see what I'm saying? And we do that all the time. We do it in our marriages. We do it in our... We do it in our... Look at that clean-cut boy there. <laughs> That's a CEO in the making right there, buddy. <laughs> You're looking at the chief executive position. Anyway, see my father pat you on the head for that. Good job. We were never allowed to have facial hair in my family because my father was very adamant about that. And both my boys had facial hair. Huh? It is, but you know, Dad used to say, why do you want to grow on your, cultivate on your face what you can let grow wild on your rear end? <laughs> <laughs> and that made more sense to young men growing up. So anyway, he was a judge, so what can you say? What can you say? But this is, this is human nature, this right here. God, why? What's happening? How can I get out of this mess? It's never, and it's kind of a blaming sense. It's never kind of any assumption of responsibility where we say, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's me. Um, and I guarantee you, if you ever know a pastor who went to a church and got everybody stirred up and caused all kinds of trouble, and then was leaving or thrown out or whatever, and you asked him, what do you, well, what went wrong? He would never say, oh, I screwed up. And they would always say, well, these people did that, they did this, they did that. It's everybody else's fault in the world except his. And that's human nature. That's who we are. That's what we do every day of our lives. Now, it is the wiser, more mature man or woman in God who does, when circumstance does come, they don't blame God. They don't ask God why it happened. They f simply turn to the Lord for strength and say, how can I master it? Now, this implies that you believe 
in God, first of all, how many of us believe in God? Well, a lot of people in this world don't. But if you turn to God to say, how can I take care of this? It also implies that not only do you believe there is a God, but you believe the God is concerned about you. Concerned about you. A lot of people will acknowledge a God, but they won't acknowledge the fact that, that, that God really does care about me. I used to have a phrase that I would teach kids in youth group and stuff like that. And I said, do you realize, and I look at these nasty, snotty little kids, and I said, do you realize that if you were the only human being on this earth, according to God's Bible, he still would have sent Christ to die for you. And you know, kids can't believe that. They go, oh, okay, you never do that. I said, sure you would. Why wouldn't he? Everything he promises from the earliest of scriptures about Messiah is that he's coming to save each and every individual. Everything about Revelation, the creepy stuff, at the very end says every one of you will stand individually before the Lord and he'll make a decision. You won't have your brother with you. You won't have mom and dad with you. You know, you won't have anybody with you. You won't have your family, you won't have your kids, you won't have your grandpa. You're going to stand before the Lord, and the scriptures are quite plain. Fully naked, whatever that means. I don't think it means without clothes. I think it means fully known. There's nothing you have done or had ever thought about that God doesn't already know. Right? So don't come up there with any excuses. Well, Lord, you know, it really wasn't by. Yes, it was. Well, it was him that didn't know it wasn't. So from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, God focuses on the individual. How many of us believe in God? Well, a lot of people go, I believe in God. How many of us believe that God would do everything God would do, even if it was just for me? Well, see, so you're a little bit older, a little bit more mature in Christianity. Most people aren't. Most people jump to this right away. Why, God? They don't go jump to this, give me strength, and they don't ever, even if they acknowledge God, very few of them really believe that God is concerned with only you. And this, is the, this is the problem with Mr. Ecclesiasticus here. He's trying to get his head wrapped around this, but he's a far off from getting it wrapped around this. Because when you hit this, now you are becoming a mature adult. And you can finally begin to understand a little bit deeper this thing or this being called God. And you begin to understand him in a positive way, not a negative way. This is Christian maturity down here. And you go, well, Tom, we know all this stuff. Yeah, that's the problem. I know how to play football, too, but I've never played football in the NFL. It's a shame, too, because I would be an easy target for those guys to kill. I know all about flying a plane, but I don't have a plane to fly. I don't have a license to fly. So it's probably a good idea that I don't get behind the cockpit. My father-in-law taught me everything there was to know about flying a plane, but I don't, I've never flown a plane. See what I'm saying? I can know everything there is to know about God, but until I get to this point where my belief doesn't just acknowledge, but begins to associate in a positive sense, I will never mature in Christianity, just like a child, if he never takes responsibility for anything, will never mature as a man or a woman. It's the same principle. We have to grow our faith. We have to grow in our faith. And the only beneficiary to doing that is yourself. If Kukaracha becomes the holiest woman on the planet, that's no benefit whatsoever to her sons or her husband. Really only for her. Now they can witness it and say, Mom, I want to be like you. 
And she can help teach them, but they're going to have to grow up themselves. See what I'm saying? Same thing is true with the redemption promise. Same thing is true with the ultimate judgment in chapter 20 of Revelation. When you stand before God, God's going to sit there, bring forth the Racha. And Racha will stand before him. And Tim ain't going to be anywhere around, neither are you guys. And she's going to have to do explaining, which she's got an out, though, because God doesn't understand Racha language either. <laughs> She'll be going, blah, 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 and God's going, what the word? Just put her in heaven. Just get her out of here. <laughs> so you might have something working for you with that Roger. <laughs> yeah, back in Genesis, I thought confusing the languages would be a good idea. <laughs> okay. Chapter 7 is where he is still wrestling with right here, number 1. And he's going to touch, just, you know, how you dip your toe in the water, see if it's cold at the beach. He's going to touch down here just once or twice, which is a good sign for our boy, because up until now, it's just been down, down, down. You know, everything sucks. Everything stinks. Everything's rotten. I, nothing in the world is any good. Not even people. They're not any good. So for him to take the positive step, shows a tiny little bit of spiritual maturity or a tiny little bit of development. At least a step in the right direction. He hadn't, by far, he hadn't got to the destination yet, but he's taken a step in the right way. And that's what chapter 7 is. It's a turning point of the whole book. All right, let's look at chapter 7. And you'll also notice Ecclesiasticus, uh, we're thinking he's Solomon... Because if you go back into the, the Proverbs, a lot of it is attributed to Solomon, and a lot of it sounds like it came out of Ecclesiastes. See what I'm saying? Ecclesiastes was written after the Proverbs. Okay? So when you see that kind of literature, but they were both written during the time or the reign of Solomon. When God made him the smartest guy on the planet, and then he screwed everything up. <laughs> God makes you wonder about that smartest guy on the planet thing, huh? So anyway, you've heard this before, and where you've heard it is in the Proverbs. So, right off the bat, a good name is better than a great ointment, or a good ointment. That's a proverb. If you go into the book of Proverbs, right there. To have a good name is better to have than having a good cure for what's ailing your reputation your integrity your honesty your character a good name is better than the finest ointment and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth well that's that step back into the negative again oh it was me i wish i'd never been born that's voltaire you know voltarian language well, that's the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, fo you gotta fold in there. You know, when they tell you to stir stuff in, sometimes the recipe says fold it in. Why? Well, gently. They don't want you stirring it up real bad. You gotta fold in the fact that God's intent was to create us, mm -hmm. and that we, He created us for the purpose of relationship and union. This is what we call calm union. Calm means with. Union means together. Together with. It's communion. It's God. You see? So if you remember the purpose and the intent of Genesis chapter 2, Genesis 1 is in the beginning was God. You know? God said, let there be, let there be, let there be. Light, you know, air, water, Tupperware, all this stuff, saran wrap. And he created everything. But it went until chapter 2 and he said... God said, let us make man in our image. So it was his expressed purpose intent to create us for the purpose of relationship. Now, chapter 3, they broke that relationship, of course, listening to Satan. And the whole rest of the Bible is God's expressed intent to restore that relationship. So to, be, to say it would be better if I was never born means... You're rejecting God's intent and purpose 
for mankind to exist in the first place. So you got to fold that in there with that thinking. I just like looking at it. Well, that's why I'm up here in front of all you guys trying to teach us that. For myself, I, I can't wait to see Christ face to face. Well, that's when you grab the redemption thing and say, I don't hope I go to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. There you go. And then you say, Jesus is going to meet me on that day. that for me personally. When I die and close my eyes the last time, God, Jesus will be right there mm -hmm. to take me by the hand, lead me forth in the perfect peace into the heaven. So I think at the time this thing was written, the author had no clue of, right. of what was coming out. Of Jesus and all that. So they didn't believe Probably that. not. No, I know yeah. that. So well, that was really kind of dark in there because it's like he... In all I fairness, exist, in all fairness, you're right. Everything thought, everyone at that day and age thought life ended at the grave. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the great phrase was all, I forget how it goes, something like all wisdom, no matter how much is amassed, ends at the burial site. So you can be the smartest, most incredible inventor, scientist on the planet, but the minute you drop dead, it's all lost. Now we got to start over again. And that's kind of his thinking here, too. Anything that I'll ever discover has already been discovered. Why bother? Anything that's going to be invented has already been invented. Why bother? You see? And that's that, the pessimistic of man has no purpose. Well, God created us for purpose. Not just pleasure, but for purpose. And that purpose is to be in union with him. Come, communion is what we call our little sacrament. And this is why Jesus said, do it as often as you need to in remembrance of whom? Him and his purpose. He wants you to be in relationship with him and not a casual relationship. That's why he always uses the bride and the bridegroom image. That's not a casual. You go to that honeymoon night, that's not a casual relationship. That's, you know, both people fully involved, exposed, and made, making themselves vulnerable to be together strong. When you really get down to it, that's what's going on. So that's why he uses the bride and the bride. He don't want to be your friend. God never intended to be your friend. He wants you to be intimate in a relationship with him. But this is the part we have a trouble getting our heads around. We go through life going, yeah, God's big, giant, powerful, mighty, occasionally gives me a, throws me a bone, but, you know, he doesn't really care about all my little troubles. Whoa. <laughs> Don't speak for God. That's your ignorance sounding off there. He does care for you. Every thought you think, he knows it before you think it. Every word you will ever say in your whole life, he already knows it before you will say it. And everything you've ever done in the light or the dark. Well, let's go to the video. <laughs> He's got the video right there. So, how anyone can say, well, God doesn't really care about me. Wrong. On every level. If you were the only person on the planet, God still would have gone through all this trouble and sent his son to save you. That's, and I hate to be cliche here, but that's the God's honest truth. Okay? A good name is better than a good ointment. The day of one's death, better than the day of one's birth. No, it isn't. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, because that is the end of every man. And the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. But for when a face is sad, a heart can be happy. But when the mind is wise, it, who is in the house of mourning? While the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure, it is better to listen and to rebuke to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of the fools. For as the crackling of thorn bushes under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. All of this is futility. For oppression makes a, man, uh, makes a wise man mad, and a bribe corrupts his heart. 
The end of the matter is better than its beginning. Patience of spirit is better than the haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of the fool. Do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. Wisdom along with the inheritance is good and an advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is protection, just as money is protection. But the advantage of, not, of knowledge is that the wisdom preserves the lives of those who possess. Consider then the work of God. For who is able to straighten what he has been? In the day of prosperity, be happy. In the day of adversity, consider that God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not discover anything that will uh, be after him. For I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise, for why should you exhaust yourself or ruin yourself? I might say that. Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? For it is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in the city. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. Also, do not take seriously all the words which are spoken, lest you hear even your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. For I have tested all this with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise. But it was really far from me. For what has been, <coughs> uh, what has been is remote and remains exceedingly mysterious. Who then can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. I have discovered more bitter, <clears throat> more bitter than death the woman whose heart is a snare and a net for whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Behold, I have discovered all of this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find his explanation, which I am still seeking, but I have not found. I have found one man amongst a thousand, but I have not found one woman amongst all these. Behold, I have only found this, that God made men upright, but they instead have sought out many devices. Pretty ugly thing. He's still part of this human blaming everybody but himself. But he's at least saying he's investigating God. He's checking it out. He just hadn't really seen any answers that apply to him. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? He calls himself the wise man, and the fool is the one who chases after a God he cannot know. Well, the fool is at least trying. The fool is on his way to church, whistling a tune, waiting to meet his mom. The fool is a little child whom God purposed on this earth. That little child doesn't know the full purpose of his relationship with God yet. But he's trusting in God enough to let him grow into it. Call that blind trust. Okay, call it whatever you want. Call it childlike foolishness. Even Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you will not see the kingdom of God. Why would he make such a statement as that? What does that child know for a fact? He has trust in God. Well, he has trust in God, but he has an example right before his eyeballs. That's his mom. Mm -hmm. That child trusts his mom to feed him, to take care of him, to heal his little hurts. Basically, to 
personal maintenance on every part of his being until he's old enough to, you know, put the band-aid on himself. He has no question about his mom or his mom's intention or his mom's actions toward him because most children, unless they're abused, I know, don't overthink it. But most children have an implicit trust with their parents. Mine did. I didn't beat them. I didn't punch them. I didn't, you know, starve them to death, abuse them in any shape or form. And today they call me dad. Now, if the child didn't care for me or didn't love me or didn't like me or didn't respect me, would he call me dad? No. Would he call me at all? <laughs> no. That's where the child is. The child is not yet concerned about himself because he knows there's a parent who is. Very few four-year-olds come in and say, Mom, can I make myself some scrambled eggs, bacon, and orange juice? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Very few four-year-olds do that. They just come in and say, Mom, I'm hungry. And Mom says, well, don't worry. I made you scrambled eggs and bacon and orange juice and a muffin. And the kid goes, yeah. Sits down, eats it gladly, joyfully. They all have a wonderful time. Welcome to the new day. Child's happy, mom's happy. Mom feels like a mom, child feels like a child. That's loved by a mom, that feels like a mom. Everything is wonderful, right? All right, go off and play with your Legos. That's what we're striving for. Unless you become a, like a child, Jesus sets a child in front of, in front of all these grown men Fishermen, zealots, crooks, thieves. And since you've got to become like this or you'll never see heaven. Never. That's a pretty poignant lesson when you think about it. Nicodemus, the great wise priest, came to Jesus by the stealth of night. And he says, we think you are from God because you couldn't do all this stuff if you weren't. And Jesus didn't answer that. He said... Unless you become like a child and are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus in all his wisdom said, now how is it possible for an old man like me to be born again? To enter again into his mother's womb. And Jesus said, behold the wind. You feel it. You hear it but you don't see it. You don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it's going because you're not in control of it. Such is the Spirit of God. You can be born again, but not in the way you think, in a controlled way that you think. It's in God's way. And it can be a beautiful relationship. Now, unless you're born again was how he told the great wise priest. But the apostles, he just put a child in front of him and said, unless you become like this child, born anew, fully dependent upon and trusting dad, you will not see the kingdom of God. Now, this guy here is still trying to take control of himself. I've done this, I've done that, and I had no satisfaction. So I tried this, and I tried that, and I got no satisfaction. So I did this, never thinking of a greater one than himself. And when he does, he says, well, the man who comes forth in righteousness simply dies in his righteousness. He's no different than me. Is that so? Well, I would quote the prophets to you. Does a man see like God sees? I look at Barbara, I see a reasonably nice person, a little older than myself, probably more experienced in years than myself. But do I really know Barbara inside? Probably pretty much so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know her dreams, her desires, her successes, her defeats, her losses. 
I don't know what causes her hurt or pain. I don't know what causes her joy and elation. I mean, some things are a given. If I punch her in the face, she's not going to like that. If I, if I hit her with a pie, <laughs> she wouldn't like that either. But if I made her a pie, she might go, oh, that's wonderful. I don't like that kind of pie. Okay, well, the fact of the matter is you are uniquely you. I am uniquely me. And God even doesn't know what's in Racha over there. It's just, just crazy stuff. She's a lot like God in one sense. Timeless. <laughs> It happens when it happens, you know? The point I'm trying to make is to judge another based on what we perceive is at best wrong every time. Every time. Well, she's a mean lady. I don't like. Maybe she's having a bad day. Maybe she's got a headache. Maybe she's got a toothache. Maybe, you know, she just lost her husband or her kid got arrested or. You know, but to say that she's a mean lady, label her as such, wow, that's pretty powerful. To, and that's what we do all the time with labels. Well, you're a racist. How do you know I'm a racist? Because you just are. I heard you speak whatever, and you said that some people should be doing things better than others. Well, maybe some people can do things better than others. You know, I always get back to the old question, who should be in the first chair of the violin section in the symphony? That's an easy question to answer, isn't it? The one who can. All of you guys play the violin. All right, Tim, go. Racha, go. It's Racha music. <laughs> and I go, you know, Jeremy, Zach, go. And Laura, go. And I finally say, well, you know, sorry guys, but Laura's really the best one here. Most trains, sweetest, hit all the lumps, hit all the strings, plays with panache. So the one who should play first chair is the one who can play first chair, right? Who should be quarterback of the team? Well, you got 55 guys on the team. Which one plays quarterback? Oh, well, uh, they can all catch the ball. They can all throw the ball. They can all run the ball. So who plays quarterback? Come on, guys, this isn't rocket that's science. The best one. The one who can. Yeah, the guy who can throw the most accurate, who can throw the farthest, who can scramble the best, who can get himself free, the guy who can make the play. And even if it's a broken play for lost yardage, he still gets it off somehow to get back at least to the line of scrimmage. That's the guy you want playing quarterback, not the other 50 guys. Now, does that make the quarterback racist? No, it doesn't. So you see what? We, we label people, we call them names, we judge them, we put a label on them that is like forever in our minds, never having really truly considered in our brain if it's fair or not. Welcome to Mr. Ecclesiasticus. That's what he's doing. As long as you do that, then you just stay in your own little muddled world of it ain't me, it's them. Until you can look beyond yourself, reach beyond yourself, to a greater being, a parent, if you will, Abba, Father, said Jesus. When you pray, say, Abba, Father. And that starts, that's the step in the right direction. The first step. Not just an acknowledgement of God, but just a little tweak into the world that maybe he's more than just God. Maybe he's Father. You know what I hate, by the way? And I'm labeling people because I'm a racist. It's a seminary problem, really. If you ever go to seminary, uh, the, problem, the, the, the problem that I have with seminaries are all the students are trying to out-God each other. And there's a characteristic in seminary that I find particularly aggravating. 
because oftentimes at seminary, the professors will say, you know, Zachary, Jeremy, would you start our class in prayer? Well, you're in front of 60 other guys, and this is your chance to shine, right? Think about it for a minute. So these seminarians, they start with the common phrase. Father God, I thank you, Father God, for this day, Father God, because, Father God, you've put all of these men here, Father God, that we can train, Father God, to learn of you, Father God. And I'm thinking, the Lord probably knows who he is. Stop with the Father God stuff, will you? And they go on and on and on. And then to make matters worse, they pray about everybody except themselves. You ever think about that? Prayers are just more projections of one upon the, the many. And I sit there and I listen to these prayers and I said, you know, if I were you, I would shut up and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm not worthy to even begin to address you or any of these, my colleagues. Be merciful to all of us who are sinners. Amen. You want to label everybody? Use the one God said. All flesh has sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord. But you listen. Sometimes we have guest ministers and, and, and they'll pray like that. And when they do, from now on, I want you all to go, oh, I've heard this before. Now, is he a bad prayer? No, he's just not a good thinker. I've tried this, it didn't work. I tried that, it didn't work. He did this, it didn't work. He's a righteous guy, he didn't work. The wicked guy, he seemed to get ahead for a while, but he ended up with the righteous guy, both in the same box. They're both dead. I did this. I, you see what I'm saying? Never once say, Lord, why can't I get along in this world? Why can't I understand who I am, but so quickly understand who everybody else is? Well, Tom, we just don't do that. I know we don't do that. But see, the Lord has spent a lot of effort, time, and trouble to get us to see ourselves. Remember back in the, in, in the garden with Adam and Eve? Who screwed up there, really? Oh, oh. Well, uh, uh, initially it was Eve, right? Yes, initially. Initially. She ate the apple, and she went and gave it to Adam, and Adam said, yeah, that looks good. And he ate. But the, the, real, the real culprit there was Satan and the serpent. Right? Mm -hmm. So they hid themselves in the leaves. I mean, they went and got fig leaves and, you know, pasted them all over themselves. And they hid themselves in the bushes. And God came walking in the middle of the day to, you know, walk with his friends, his relationships. And he said, where are you guys? Not like he didn't know where they were. And they very wisely said, we're hiding in the bushes. <laughs> well, if you're hiding in the bushes, you don't generally tell people where you are. He says, why are you hiding in the bushes? And there, you remember their answer? Because we're naked. <laughs> and God said, who told you you were naked? Did you do something you shouldn't have done? Of course, Adam was a brave man. He stepped right up and said, Lord, it was her. She did it. <laughs> she gave me the apple And she was just as brave. She stood next to him and said, it wasn't me. It was the snake. Wonderful. It was him. It was her. It was the snake. God says, fine. I'll tell you what we're going to do. He looks at Adam and says, oh, boy. From dust you were made, dust you will return, pal. You're going out of the garden. You're going to have to get a job for the first time in your life. And you will work from dawn, sun up to sun down all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat thistle and thorn and eke out an existence until you drop and rot. And you, pal, 
our landfill. Well, you know, that's not quite the prize I was expecting. <laughs> but the woman was no better. He got to her and said, oh, first of all, you're the one that's going to carry the babies and you're going to hate it. I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. Now, what did that mean? Well, I don't know. Uh, before the sin, I guess he would just crank them out, you know. Boom, 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 boom. There's nine of them. And then you go on and, you know, go swimming the next day. But now, I will greatly increase your pain at childbirth. That's incredible because he gets, says, go forth and multiply. But you're going to hate every minute of it, mostly. You're going to be sick. You're going to throw up a lot. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing's going to be a rocky road. Isn't it funny how we, you know, girls will say, oh, I didn't have any problems at all. And all the other women go, yeah, I hate you right away. You know, because we had the worst pregnancies in the world. Well, first of all, those girls who say they had no problems at all are lying to you. <laughs> because God said they did have a hard time. Second of all, uh, the Lord said, and I'm going to throw in a little kicker. You know what that was? You remember what the curse of the woman was? You will be subservient to the male your whole life, but your whole life will be spent and dreamt and purposed to master him. You will always be trying to get ahead of him, above him, you know, but you never will, really. He will always be stronger. He will always be, you know, the fighting agent. And you will always be subservient. That's a pretty strong curse there, ladies. But the guy, well, we're going to drop and riot. But the lady, you're going to spend your life figuring out a way to get on top of him. Knowing full well you never will. Not in, at least in God's perspective. And you're going to hate making these guys. <laughs> and not a real nice outlook for one's career, you know. And of course to the snake, he said, you shall be cursed. We don't know what it was beforehand, but the Lord said, you will have no arms and legs. You eat the dust. You will slither along the ground until somebody takes their foot and crushes your skull which is what Christ does, of course. He says, and then you will just be no more. So, I didn't need it. She gave it to me. I didn't need it. The snake told me to do it. Which one of you got away with it? Nobody. And that's who we are to this day. That's who chapter 7 is. I tried this and it didn't work. I tried that, it didn't work. He suggested God, it didn't work. The righteous guy and the wicked guy both ended up in a box. What difference does it make? If there is a God, the only saving, redeeming grace, he says, if there is a God, could it ever be that we can connect to him? Well, the Lord says, seek me and I, you will find me. Ask and I will answer. If you lack wisdom, I will grant it fully. But see, you've got to take the first step. God's, I stand at the door and knock, said Jesus. Did he ever come in? Mm -mm. It says, if you open it, I will come in and I will dine with you and I will dwell with you. If you open the door. That's that first step again. But see, many of us in this planet right now, 2022, I think it's funny, we always say, Amino Day, the year of our Lord. <laughs> All the years are the years of our Lord. If you even you put that in your brain, you'd realize, well, this year I have the same opportunity to know God that I did last year. But last year, I didn't know God. So what am I going to do with it this year? I'm an OD. 2022. The year of our Lord. I stand at the door and knock. If you open the dang door, I will come in. 
and we can start working on a relationship that eventually you'll not un only understand, but hopefully you will cherish. You will cherish. And I will prove it to you in many ways throughout your life. You will see, as Jesus promised to His boys, what you have seen, others will see. What you have known, others will know. And his final prayer before being crucified was, Lord, I thank you for these who have seen and heard and know, but I pray especially for those who will never see or hear my, myself personally, but will still come to believe. Jesus says, these are the guys I'm praying for. They don't have a Savior doing all this crazy stuff for them. All they have is that idiot preacher, Chanter. But somehow through it all, they will hear and see these words and come to belief. And that's who Jesus prays for specifically just the last thing before His crucifixion. I pray for those that aren't even born yet, that won't be born for 2,022 years. That's who I'm praying for. That they, above nothing else in their life accomplished, they at least take that first step to understanding this. Chapter 7 is him just about, just about to take that step. You'll notice chapter 7 is in poetry rather than narrative. And that is a signal that attitude is changing. He's moving from the strict Oh, white, black, dark, white, you know, to the, well, maybe there's a bigger picture here. It's a, it's a kind of a technique the Bible uses many times, especially in the Psalms, where they move from narrative to poetry, where the heart is being enlarged, the mind is trying to open up a little bit, the eyes are beginning to focus on something bigger than itself. Just a little trick in the literature itself. Okay? Chapter 8 is going to be a little better. Slowly but surely, this monkey's going to come to know his Lord. But right now, he's standing on that parisope. Do I walk this way or do I not? Remember Indiana Jones? And he had to go and he had to, only the penitent shall pass. And he goes on his knees and the slicers go over him. And then he has to walk in the name of God and he misspells God and about goes through. And lastly, he comes to that great canyon, that separation between himself and the prize. And he says, only the leap of faith. And he can't see anything, but he has to step out there and he goes, that's what this is, that leap of faith. You can't see it, but the bridge is there. It's always been there. Okay? He's about to make that leap of faith. Should I leave those in the table 